of Lawton Childs, uh, the, the populist, very popular uh, two-term governor and longtime senator, U.S. senator from Florida, uh, written by John Despasos Coggin, who interviewed hundreds, well, not hundreds, over hundreds, certainly people, uh, family, friends, uh, co-workers of Lawton Childs. So we'd encourage you to look at that and other books in our bookstore. Uh, our associate director, Barbara West, is around here somewhere, and she'll be happy to uh, uh, show you all of our all of our great books. We also managed the historic Rossiter House Museum in O'Galley. Uh, Carrie Rossiter was the last resident of that house. She was a fascinating woman. Uh, in 1921, at the age of 23, she took over her father's Standard Oil Agency. And as the story goes, she went up to Kentucky uh, to ask for to take over the agency. And uh, they, they, the board of directors argued about it while she listened to the keyhole. And finally, somebody said, oh, let the little lady have it. She'll fail in a year, and we'll give it to a man. Uh, well, as it turns out, she ran it successfully for 62 years. It was the longest running standard oil agent in the country. It uh, has a letter from President Reagan and uh, all sorts of accolades. Uh, and we very proudly operate her house museum. We are also the proud hosts of the Florida Public Archaeology Network East Central Region. Dr. Rachel Wenz is their director. Uh, happy to have her here with us. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, they do all sorts of great outreach as well. We have all sorts of educational outreach the state, uh, including our uh, Florida Frontiers, the weekly radio magazine of the Florida Historical Society. And I know there's uh, some people from different parts of the state here that get it at different times. Here locally, it's on 90.7 WMFE, Thursday evenings at 6.30, and uh, again, Sunday afternoons at 4.00, uh, but airs at different times on different NPR affiliates around the state. Uh, although we are the statewide historical society, we are not funded by the state. We are an independent 501c3. So if you are not a member, we would certainly encourage your membership in the society. And just briefly, if you do become a member today, uh, we have a uh, lovely tote bag possibilities for you here uh, with the FHS logo. If this looks too much like FSU and you're not a Seminole fan, <laughs> we also have it in green. <laughs> but, uh, uh, also today, if you become a member, it includes a $40 book, a history, the classic history of Florida by Thibault uh, and Marina. And uh, of course, as a member of the Florida Historical Society, you get four issues of our Florida Historical Quarterly, which has great uh, scholarly, academic articles on a wide variety of, of subjects. And again, hot off the presses just this week, our, our latest newsletter, the Society Report, uh, which you will also get four times a year. Uh, and you'll get all the latest information about all the great things that we do, like, like this event here today. But of course, the best part of being a member of the Florida Historical Society is the knowledge that you're helping with all of the, the great educational outreach that we do. Uh, we do all sorts of great programs, uh, like this one, uh, here at the Library of Florida History, but also around the state. One of the things we're known for is our annual meeting and symposium. And every year we're in a different Florida city. Uh, in recent years we've been in Tampa and Jacksonville, uh, St. Augustine, Pensacola. but. Uh, Next year, 2013, we knew we had to do something special because it's the 500th anniversary of the naming of our state by Juan Ponce de Leon. Uh, and so uh, we decided that we would follow in his path. So on May 23rd, Thursday, uh, we're going to leave out of Port Canaveral and on the Carnival Sensation and go down to uh, Nassau, Bahamas. Uh, Ponce de Leon himself will be on board to, to welcome us. <laughs> And uh, as we travel through the Bahamas Friday morning, we will have our usual roundtable discussions and panel presentations. Uh, and then we'll arrive at Nassau about noon. We'll have special buses that are just for us, our own historic tours of Nassau, Bahamas. Uh, then all day Saturday, while we're at sea, again, the, the uh, paper presentations and roundtable discussions that we're known for will be taking place all day, along with our awards luncheon. And then we'll pull in uh, after following the path Roughly, of course, nobody knows exactly where he landed, <laughs> but uh, we, we uh, will pull into Port Canaveral, which is in that zone of where he most likely landed. Uh, so it will be a very special event. Uh, uh, cabins are going quickly, but we do have some left. Uh, if you would like to sign up, Barbara can help you with that as well uh, today. But uh, today we are here uh, for a very special occasion to celebrate the 75th anniversary of Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God and the 70th anniversary of Stetson Kennedy's Palmetto Country. And of course, Sora Neale Hurston, the writer, folklorist, and anthropologist, 
uh, arguably the most significant cultural figure to come from Central Florida, certainly uh, wrote nonfiction works uh, as well as novels, but she's best known for Their Eyes Were Watching God, which uh, tells the story of uh, Janie Crawford and her efforts at self-realization. It's told in flashback from her porch uh, in Eatonville, uh, talking about her trials and tribulations that she's gone through in her life. Uh, it tells a lot about the, the uh, history of Eatonville, uh, her adopted hometown. Uh, as a, they go down to the Miami area, there's a historic hurricane that's depicted. Uh, a very interesting novel, which we'll be talking about. Stetson Kennedy's Palmetto Country. Uh, Stetson Kennedy, in the late 1930s and early 1940s, went all over the state of Florida with a recorder about, about half the size of this table, a huge, <laughs> huge recorder that he called The Thing. It took several men to move it. And uh, he talked with all sorts of different folks. Uh, he talked with uh, Greek sponge divers in Tarpon Springs and uh, Latino cigar workers in uh, the Keys and in Tampa. Uh, he talked with Seminole, the Seminole tribe. He talked documenting, documenting the history of, of everyday people which made his uh, work quite unique. And interestingly, as we'll be talking about, uh, these two great Florida writers, their lives intersected, as, as we'll be talking about, uh, when both worked for the WPA Florida Writers Project. Uh, Stetson Kennedy was Sora Neale Hurston's supervisor, uh, which we'll be talking about. But, but these, these two works, uh, uh, important anniversaries this year, and, and uh, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity for us all to talk about them today. And we have an illustrious panel to do just that. Uh, first is M.Y. Nathiri, who is with the Association of Observe, uh, the Eatonville community. Uh, she's been with them from their beginnings and really founded the organization. Uh, in 1987, during the 100th anniversary of the historic town of Eatonville, the oldest incorporated African-American municipality in the United States, uh, celebrating its 125th uh, anniversary this year, uh, but back then, in 1987, it was celebrating its 100th anniversary, and Orange County decided to, that they were going to put a four-lane road right through the center of the town, basically destroying this, this <coughs> historic town. And uh, NY and Theory and the Association of Preserve the Eatonville community stopped that by utilizing the, the history of this town, the fact that it is the oldest incorporated African-American municipality in the United States, and the fact that Zora Neale Hurston was, was from this town. She... Uh, grew up there, and uh, many of her books were based there. Uh, Mrs. Nathiri is, is uh, author and editor of the book Zora, Zora Neale Hurston, A Woman and Her Community, and we're very happy to have her here today. Uh, Sandra Parks is uh, an author, an educator, an activist, uh, a bookstore owner in, in St. Augustine, um, and uh, she has written works that uh, uh, promote uh, critical thinking in students and has done a lot of work uh, in, that, in that area. Also for uh, the, the last years of uh, Stetson Kennedy's life, she was his wife and constant companion uh, and can tell us a lot about uh, Stetson and his work. And we're very happy to have you here as well. Uh, Dr. Morris O'Sullivan, also known as Saki O'Sullivan, uh, is the Kenneth Curry Chair of Literature at Rollins College. Uh, he is an expert in uh, Florida literature in particular. Uh, he uh, has edited and written much about Florida literature. Uh, the Florida Reader uh, was one of his books, uh, Poetry in Florida. Uh, the Florida Historical Society Press is very proud to have published uh, A Trip to Florida for Health and Sport, the lost 1855 novel of Cyrus Parker's Condit, which uh, uh, Saki worked on, and uh, Wen Chun Zhang, the uh, archivist, at uh, Rollins College, found this handwritten manuscript from 1855 that he kind of had forgotten about, turned it over to, to uh, Dr. Sullivan, who quickly realized its importance, and as a, uh, one of the first novels written, actually written in Florida, many novels were written from outside of Florida, kind of idealized versions of Florida life, but this novel was clearly written by somebody who had hunted and fished and camped along the St. John's River. And, so it's an important, uh, important book, and we're happy to have published that. And uh, he can offer his perspective as well. Happy to have him here today too. So let's let's welcome our panel. Please. Okay. Well, well, first, as I, as I mentioned, uh, well, it, it, Sonia Hurston claimed Eatonville as her hometown. If you if you read Dust Tracks on a Road, her. 
autobiography. The opening pages begin with what was going on in Eatonville and people running around, all, all of the activity happening. Uh, but that's fiction. She, she, she made that up. She was actually born in Alabama. But we can, we can certainly uh, give her that artistic license because Eatonville, uh, growing up there, uh, definitely had a significant impact on Hurston and her work, uh, particularly her unique views on race for uh, a woman in the 1920s and, and 30s. Uh, so I, I'd like to, to have you comment, uh, just in the theory, on uh, Eatonville's role in shaping Zora Neale Hurston's uh, work and, and her views that we can see in her work. Let me uh, paraphrase it a bit or start by saying, as she opens Dust Tracks on a Road, um, though she was not born there, what she describes of Eatonville is accurate when she says, I was born in a Negro town. I do not mean by that the black backside of an average town. Eatonville, Florida is and was at the time of my birth a pure Negro town, mayor, town marshal, and all. It was not the first Negro community in America, but it was the first to be incorporated, the first experiment of self-government by Negroes in America. And that perspective having grown up in that environment really shapes a great deal the way that Zora Neale Hurston approaches her aesthetic. In fact, she is an informed observer, having studied under Dr. Franz Boas, uh, the preeminent um, um, scholar, American scholar coming from uh, outside the country, but really known as the father of anthropology. And so Zora Neale Hurston is able to appreciate Eatonville in a way that perhaps others would not have been. Uh, and that is understanding it, as she says, her native village. And I must say that until recently, it really didn't come home to me what she was saying. When she said native village, she really meant that. My mother, who's 94, talks about the fact that everyone in the town knew each other because it, there might have been a couple hundred people there. So when she talks about it as her native village, she really does mean it in the sense of a very small group of people. In fact, Eatonville didn't have a thousand people until 1960. So you, you really can get that, uh, that appreciation. Now, as the informed observer, the, the stories that she heard, the people's um, folk ways, she saw them as, as really a person of much conviction. She saw beauty there. She saw Eatonville as having a kind of um, purity uh, that translated or that you could see or experience from the stories. And so the genius of Zora Neale Hurston, frankly, is her ability to recognize that the aesthetic in which she lived was something that represented a kind of dignity and that she was able to translate in her writing. And because she was uh, the quintessential storyteller, um, those stories relate to people no matter their background. And I, I will leave this point by recounting a story that uh, I uh, experienced as an undergraduate at Ithaca College in the late 1960s, and she was in the late 1960s. The late uh, Nobel laureate Isaac Bashevich Singer was delivering a talk uh, at Ithaca College, and he um, was asked by an undergraduate, by a co ed well, Mr. Singer, why is it that you just write about the Jewish experience? And he said, I write about the Jewish experience because that's what I know very well. And then he went on to say that all literature, if it's to be considered great, has to come from a particular space, a particular place. If it's truly great literature, it's going to resonate with people from different backgrounds because there's a kind of humanity that is a part of all of us. And so a person in South America or in Europe or in Japan will still enjoy my stories, he says, because there's a kind of, there's a, there is a veracity and an authenticity.
city there. And I would say to you that our the Eatonville experience and Zorima Hurston's writing about it, uh, today she is read and enjoyed universally because the example of their eyes are watching God and the, and the protagonist, Jimmy Crawford's search for identity is something that all of us who are sentient are going to
she was a trained anthropologist. Uh, Stetson had been to the University of Florida, but left there to, to uh, work for the WPA. But they had an, uh, uh, an unusual relationship. Their politics were very different. Hurston was very conservative politically, and, and Stetson was extremely liberal and, and progressive. Uh, so if you could shed some light on their relationship. Well, it might be helpful to start with uh, remembering how very young and formative Stetson was at the time they worked together. Um, Stetson came to a passionate uh, love of language. Uh, while in high school and, and a highly depression, his father had a furniture store in Jacksonville, and there was this practice of a dollar down and a dollar a week uh, to buy furniture, and so uh, Stetson was um, required by his father to go into people's homes and collect the dollar, which for poor people in the middle of the Depression often meant that somebody was going to go hungry you know, if, if they gave up that dollar. And so he went into the homes of African Americans, and he went into the homes of poor white folks, and he began to listen to their language, and he began to write it down. And there were things that he heard that um, he thought were so significant that he began to keep notebooks. Things like, you got to feed white folks with a long spoon. <laughs> or, when you're in Rome, Georgia, you got to act like it. Stetson began to write down these idioms and stories that he heard that were not the way people in his rather privileged white family not the stories that they told. And so when he went to the University of Florida, obviously that was not what the University of Florida was about. So in 1935, a 19-year-old Stetson Kennedy shipped his books to Key West and hitchhiked after them. Now at that time, Key West was a broke city, and I mean financially so. The city of Key West, first of all, the hurricane had just come through. When Stetson was trying to make his way to Key West, they were still burning the bodies from the Labor Day hurricane of 1935. And Key West was desperately poor. And yet on this little island that was only two miles in one direction and five miles in another, people from very different backgrounds lived together with a kind of cultural sharing that Stetson had never seen. Cubans and conks and uh, uh, Bahamians that were black and Bahamians that were white and people called loggerheads that were people that had come down from the United States to Key West. And so he began to collect the language that he heard, the idioms that he heard. And he shipped all of this off to Benjamin Botkin, who was at that time as, in, in the Library of Congress. And so when the WPA, uh, the Works Progress Administration, um, offered folks some jobs, they sent a man named Julius Stone to Key West to take care of it. Now, Key West was so broke that it gave itself to Florida, and Florida didn't want Key West, and so Florida gave Key West to the federal government, and the federal government didn't know what to do with Key West, so it gave it to the Works Progress Administration. And this guy named Julius Stone went down there and reinvented Key West as a potential tourist attraction. So to do that, the WPA hired people to go sweep seaweed off the beaches so it would look inviting to customers. And, and, and that was the first job Stetson had. But when Botkin sent back this recommendation that Stetson ought to work for the newly formed Federal Writers Project. He figured that writing pageants about Key West was much more to his liking than raping seaweed. And so he went to work for the WPA in Key West and shortly moved home to Jacksonville. 
where he was made at 21 years old the director of ethnic studies and personal histories for the Federal Writers Project. Now, at that time, uh, the office was located in the Dialect Church building, which is on Bay Street. You, can, you see it every time you go over the Main Street Bridge in Jacksonville. But the Negro unit, the people that would ultimately gather the slave marriages, were housed at the Clara White Mission. These men, these men and women were not allowed to come into the office. The only connection is that they sent a runner over once a week to pick up their paychecks. Uh, exactly what Stetson's role was in the gathering of the slave narratives is something I'm still trying to sort out. Uh, we do know that uh, as part of his leadership, Florida was one of the few states to hire African Americans to talk to aged slaves. Remember, they had to be 80 years old or more. You know, if you were an 80-year-old black man in 1938 and a white man from the government came and asked you to talk about slavery, you know, what kind, how comfortable were you going to be uh, to give him uh, a, a good representation of it? Stetson says, quote, we decided that African Americans would be better people to interview these aged slaves than sending a white man. And actually, they hired more women. And in, in, in the 1930s, when the man's role as breadwinner was pretty much the culture to hire African-American women to go out and gather the slave narratives was a pretty radical idea. Well, one day, Corita Course, who was the director of the Federal Writers Project, calls Stetson in and said, Zora Neale Hurston has signed on with the W with the Federal Writers Project. Now that meant when you signed on to the Writers Project, you had to take a pauper's oath. And the oath said you didn't have any property, you didn't have any money, you didn't have any job, and no prospect of the first degree. So Stetson had been eminently qualified, and unfortunately, <laughs> so was Zora. And so Stetson was, uh, as they were both considered, quote, junior interviewers, even though he had this lofty title as the director of ethnic studies. Now, job description, junior interviewer. Stetson made $37.50 every two weeks, but they figured because Zora was living in Eatonville that she only needed $32 every two weeks. It, obviously, you know, the fact that she was female uh, and, um, had, and black had nothing to do with that difference, you understand. But, so Ms. Cora said, well, she's going to play us a call, and you must understand that Ms. Hurston has been feted by New York literati and is, and is given to behaviors like smoking in front of white folks. Uh, and so we are just going to have to make allowances. And so Stetson said, Zora came, Zora smoked, and we made allowances. <laughs> so for a while, and for how long and how often, I'm still trying to sort out from Stetson's writings. He and Zora traveled around Florida, as Ben had described, with this, this recording machine that was, was powered by two automobile batteries. And while they, while they did interview uh, Greek uh, tarpon, uh, tarpon Springs sponge divers and, and cattle, uh, Florida cowboys, they also went into the turpentine camps, which was involuntary servitude. Um, I must tell you, it was not until last year when I saw a film called Worse Than Slavery that I saw the human face of what my husband had talked about all the years that we were together. Uh, the, um, that whole system uh, of convict labor, convicts being people who had no crime except they didn't have a job, and in the 1930s, a fifth of the nation didn't have a job, and if you were a black man and you didn't have a job, you could be arrested, and then you would be hired out 
to a lumber camp or in, in Alabama to coal mines where you were treat where there was no great uh, incentive for people to keep you alive, at least under slavery, you were worth something, but for them you weren't worth much because there were more coming where you came from. It was a horrible system. And so Stenson insist wanted that he had already, by the way, helped write Florida Key West guidebook. But his real job was to prepare this, the Florida guidebook. Every state had one of these guidebooks. Now, President Roosevelt had said, your job is to hold a mirror, mirror to America so Americans can see what a marvelous, diverse group of people that they are. But to Stetson, that meant letting people know about forced labor and turpentine camps and road crews and uh, violations of civil rights that Americans wouldn't be all that happy about. So he and Zora traveled so more often than, than traveling with Stetson, Zora traveled with Alan Lomax, who was more like her own tra training. He was a trained musicologist. He was from New York City. He was uh, an academic. He was very well prepared for this work. Um, my guess from being able to sort out the connection between Zora and Stetson, uh, Zora probably spent more time with Alan than with Stetson. I asked him, how often did you and Zora and Alan go out together? And he said, oh, we didn't. Uh, either Alan would go out with Zora or Stetson would. But obviously, a, a white man and an African-American woman traveling together across Florida in, in the late 30s was not a comfortable situation. Very often, Zora had to sleep in her car. Um, there is the story. and. and I've heard several versions of the story. I'd really be interested in yours. I get versions of it from Lucy and Lucy Hurston and others that, that at one point uh, Zora told Alan she was going to have to um, paint him black because, um, uh, because it was too noticeable that he was hanging out in, this white man was hanging out in Eatonville. Um, in, in, in Stetson's case, I believe that, that his greatest contribution to Zora's work was respecting it enough to leave her alone and let her do it. Because remember, he was most of the time in the office in Jacksonville after they carried this battery around, this huge recording machine. Uh, Stetson said, why are you doing this? Zora is a genius at being able to mimic salt music and stories. Just send Zora out there, let her listen, let her report back, and, and save ourselves all this grief of carrying this machine around. And so when occasionally Miss Course would come in and say, what do you hear from Zora? Uh, and Stetson wouldn't have, would, would not have anything to say. She would say, well, jog her up and see what she has to send us. And Zora would send back these wonderful envelopes stuffed with material that Stetson had the good sense to recognize for the remarkable content that it was. And he never asked the question, did you gather these stories in this pay period? <laughs> no. <laughs> he didn't care. He allowed her to do her work. Uh, and, and as we're talking about, though, I, uh, Zora Hurston did have a very unique take on race, which had an impact on Stetson's work to follow, because uh, coming from her perspective, uh, it even got her in trouble, as I mentioned earlier, with her Harlem Renaissance contemporaries, and Stetson's work that followed was very much influenced by the fact that he felt certain work needed to be documented. Oh, I think that's certainly true. This uh, opportunity to travel around as they did and see Florida. Remember, he was a Jacksonville boy who hadn't done anything and gone anywhere by that time. Uh, Southerners in those days did not frequent turpentine camps. And when these travels that they made, um, 
Zora would be able to go ahead of time and go into communities and ingratiate herself and find out who to talk to and, and, and soften people up so that they could talk to them. And then Stetson would come along and be able to get into the camps, which was very dangerous, even in my generation. I used to go birth babies in the turpentine camps for my uncle when I was, uh, when I thought I wanted to be a doctor. And even then it was dangerous for, you know, white folks to be going in there. The barbed wire is on the inside. Uh, and so for Stetson, this was an experience of Florida he had never seen. He was formed as an activist and as a civil rights uh, writer the rest of his life by what he saw. And he and Zora and Alan were going around the state um, taking these interviews. Uh, and so he uh, and Zora clashed because Zora had no patience for what she called the moaning, the moaning school of literature. Whereas Stetson saw folklore as a device of social change. You know, if we're going out gathering these wonderful stories, how could you disparage a people with such humor and such wisdom in the face of the conditions that they were, were, were living in? And so he became more radicalized as a social activist. And so he and Zora uh, knocked heads over that. Um, uh, Stetson collected uh, one of the Klan documents uh, in which they, they described Zora as, you know, our kind of colored girl, uh, because the Klan itself welcomed um, her views and misunderstood them, misconstrued them, and used them for their own purposes. Because, for example, she didn't want to uh she wrote against the segregation of schools, but that was to protect uh, the African American schools and these strong educational institutions. But as you say, they were it was misinterpreted. Exactly, and Zora was right. I mean, when we look at what happened, Zora was concerned that that black children didn't need to be sitting next to white ones to learn. That was certainly true. Zora was fearful that when, uh, when black students uh, were not being uh, encouraged to be successful, were not being celebrated, were not being in, uh, in, encouraged academically by well-trained African-American teachers, that they would not be as motivated and well-prepared. Um, she was afraid that the institutions of the church and the schools that were such a powerful force in, in, um, in, the, the, uh, in improving conditions for African American people and, uh, by integration. And so many of the things, that she, when, when you look at the actual article that she wrote, many of the things that at the time, Stetson and Richard Wright and people that, that, that wanted to promote integration, um, objected to. She was right. They came, they came to pass. So hers was, was a well-founded concern, but it was one that, that was certainly um, one that put her at odds with Stetson on a personal as well as a professional level. And then, of course, we're focusing on Palmetto Country uh, primarily today of Stetson's work, but he, of course, went on to infiltrate the Ku Klux Klan and really put his life at risk and, and wrote, I wrote with the Klan, republished his, uh, the Klan Unmasked and did some really amazing work uh, in, uh, in, in civil rights. But uh, Dr. Sullivan, I want to bring you in on this uh, as well. Uh, speaking of Zora's work, you know, it, when she died in 1960, her work was uh, out of print. Uh, she had been basically uh, forgotten about. Uh, I don't believe at that time her work had ever been taught in, in college classes or high school classes. Uh, if you could address a little bit about how much that's changed now, uh, her, her rise in stature in the academic community. Um, the first thing everybody has to understand is that the, in the academic community, there is a literary stock market. And it is, in many cases, as irrational as the stock market that we all <laughs> deal with is eventually
she was completely unknown before Alice Walker wrote a famous article in 1975 in this magazine, and that she had never really been that successful a novelist. She had published more novels. She was more successful as an anthropologist. Um, that's not quite accurate. The details about her work indicate that she had a number of her works be published in the 19, early 1970s. Uh, Dust Tracks on the Road, Jonas Gordon were republished in 1971. AMS published her up in Swanee in 1971, and then again in 1974. And Negro University's Press reprinted Your Eyes Were Watching God in 1975, the same year. And she actually made some money. But from all that I've been able to learn about Zora, she liked living well. Zora enjoyed indulging herself. And she's not very tight with her money. And so when she received money, she spent money. As an example of that, the largest royalty check that she received was $943.75, which in today's Tom Clancy world, James Patterson world, doesn't seem like a lot. But in contemporary dollars, that would be about $64,000. And we also have to remember that in the late 1930s, F. Scott Fitzgerald, received a royalty check for the Great Gatsby of $5.81 a year. So $943, a good deal of money. There, there was always an awareness of Zora, but she really wasn't someone that people spoke about in the academic community, partly because a lot of important writers, not only Richard Wright, but Ralph Ellison, had thought she was not assertive enough, that she wasn't taking political enough positions. And what I, what I noticed as for a period when I started consulting for the accrediting agency, SACS, Credit All Southern Colleges, Universities, High Schools, from 1979 to 2000, was that when I began, I started time I visited college at the curriculum for American literature, I found that everyone was teaching a Hemingway novel in the 1970s, late 70s, 1980s. By the 1990s, that Hemingway novel was being replaced by Hurston, Her Eyes Were Watching God. We began seeing a major shift, which was affected by many things the rise of black studies, the rise of women's studies, and also the fact that people were beginning to understand that Florida may not be a regressive southern state, that there might be more to Florida than people had thought. So I think that she has emerged, and I sense the same thing is beginning to happen with Stetson, as Stetson's books are published are more available to people. Academics are talking about him. And those of us who knew him and can tell stories about him, because in addition to everything else, Stetson was a credible character. <laughs> Stetson was, I'll just mention one little story. When he was in his um, 90s, when he came to Rollins for the award. 92. He was 92, he came to Rollins for the award. Sandra was a wonderful wife and a protector of Stetson. And he sat at dinner. And I think Susie was on the other side of you. And he sat at dinner and he wanted to order a glass of wine. Sandra said, no, Stetson. The doctor says, no wine. And Stetson looked unhappy. And then he whispered something to Susie. And it turned out, he told Susie that every 15 or 20 minutes she had to get Sandra's full attention. <laughs> <laughs> what Sandra had a glass of wine. What Sandra couldn't understand is how that wine kept disappearing. Because every time Sandra turned to the side, 
session with grammar class. Throw it down. <laughs> and then look like a fire boy. I know you did. Yes, you did. Look like a fire boy. He's just, he just a truly original person. And he was just as strong in his conviction, his progressive convictions, at the end of his life as he was early in his life. They were deeper and richer. The other thing I think is very important about these writers what we're looking at today is the relationship that they have to us and to their sense of place. We tend to understand Florida through them and through the great writers that we've read about Florida. One of the abstract expressionists was speaking to a group of art students in Columbia, and he was asked, how did, how does the false 
Um, it was a criminal charge of child molestation. And it not only was it false, they knew it was false. She wasn't even in the country at the time that the allegations were uh, alleged. Uh, but it really literally crushed her. Uh, she left the North and came back to Florida in the 1950s. And so um, there is a, there's a kind of, there was a kind of, according to Hemingway, a kind of a convergence of circumstances, uh, some of them external uh, uh, in the marketplace, some of them external in terms of her circumstances, and a kind of, if you might say, a natural decline in her, in her ability to keep the health and other, and other um, social economic circumstances. Um, in fact, uh, Dr. Um, Henry, uh, Dr. Lewis, Henry Lewis Gates Jr. in coming back and retrieving her work talks about the fact that um, teachers who knew of her school, and people did know, I mean, she was, it was sort of like that, this kind of underground, uh, that they would make copies of Lives of Watching God. Uh, I can remember reading it um, when my first son was born, it cost 99 cents as a Penguin Classic. It now costs $15. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, every once in a while, HarperCollins reissues it with another cover, same book. But, you know, it really is a cash cow for them. So there really is, a, 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 to amplify a, a bit of, of what the professor said, you know, all of this is within a context. And certainly, Zora Neale Hurston will never be unknown again. As a matter of fact, it's really, it's, uh, there's quite an irony. Uh, she would not find it uh, an irony. She would find it as appropriate. But you are no longer considered educated if you have not, if you have not read The Rise of Watching God. Advanced placement, international baccalaureate, survey classes, you're going to encounter Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, it's, it is now she's um, the New York Times, I think, in the last five years, the 23rd most writer uh, in, in uh, American colleges and universities. And as I say, aside from that, she is the rage in Japan, in New Zealand, all over. So no matter what we talk about in terms of, th there's, there's marketability and then there's also genius. So I, I think that we will not be accused of hyperbole if we do call her a literary genius. I'd like, uh, yeah, I'd like to speak to what uh, Saki was saying about um, Zora is giving us a view uh, of, of the lives of African Americans in Florida that we would never have had. Uh, instead of giving us a view of Florida, um, that's where why Palmetto Country was written. Um, as I mentioned, there was a huge conflict within this editorial staff about what President Roosevelt meant when he said that the WP, the Work Writers Project was supposed to put a, hold a mirror to America so America could see itself. Well, to Stetson, that meant warts and all. It meant that, that America needed to see the richness and the variety and the humor, uh, the wisdom of African American culture as we were experiencing it in Florida, but it also needed to see the turpentine camps and the work gangs and, you know, free range cattle and a lot of other problems that we had in the state. And so the story is told, Stetson tells the story about how uh, this, this really is a kind of tourist guidebook. Uh, even though I, mean, it, 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 it would, I would love for someone to take these sites and, and recreate what they look like today. I used to, you, you do realize that when Stetson was working in this area, that was US-1 that ran along the Bayfront, and then along came US-1 over here, and then of course came I-95, you know. But, but uh, we used to try to travel the old US-1 just to see what the guidebook, if we, if we took it today, how much of this is still there. But um, the battle was whether we should keep the 
material about these ethnic groups in the book. There are, is, there are some stories that are quite remarkable. One of our board members here, Judy Duda, uh, is from a family of Slovaks, and there was a town called Slavia that was, that was settled by Slovaks. And in this generation, they were still speaking Slovak, and it was a separate community, and you know, it didn't have big box stores and, and you know, and Starbucks and stuff. It was really, you know, um, a, a village of folks that, that lived like this. And, but um, there was the struggle. And Stetson said that um, his group among the editors thought that they had won. They went to dinner and the other editors came in and took all the ethnic stuff out all the things that Stetson had, um, had been promoting. Uh, Stetson says they found out about it and got it back in, but if my beloved ever read this thing, there is nothing in here that is clo closely related to what Stetson believes that he and his cohorts had managed to slip back in. So he wrote Palmetto Country. He turned from being a folk, uh, a, a basically a, a, a gatherer stories to a folklorist, and there's a great deal of folklore in Palmetto Country, but Palmetto Country is a reader's view of what Florida was like in 1940. And if you want to see the pictures, the uh, 50th anniversary of Palmetto Country, uh, the exhibit that we have over here was prepared by the University of Southern Alabama for a tri-state meeting of the Florida Historical Society, the Georgia Historical Society, and the Alabama Historical Society around the book, Palmetto Country. So the folk stories, there were African American folk heroes, superheroes, in 1940, that the young black men and women of Florida today would never have heard of, that were a part of the oral tradition of African Americans in Florida at that time. And so we're grateful that the um, that Florida Historical Society, after University of Presses of Florida gave up its copyright, the, the society continues to make it available. It's probably the best social history you're going to find of Florida at the mid 20th century. And then what's so amazing is he celebrates multiculturalism now that's very popular. Everybody wants to celebrate multiculturalism, but he did it long before that, that phrase was even, even coined. Uh, I want to backtrack a, a little bit as long as we're talking about the exhibits too. Um, uh, Mr. Kathiri talked about how uh, when, uh, when Zora Neale Hurston was falsely accused <coughs> of, of child molestation in New York, she came back here to Florida. Where she came back was right here in Brevard County. Uh, in 1929, she lived in a cottage in uh, Oak Alley where she wrote uh, her most important collection of folklore, Mules and Men, uh, and then when she came back in the 1950s, uh, she moved back into the same cottage. It had, uh, the, that part of the neighborhood had formerly been an African American neighborhood, so it was still segregated, and still a time of segregation, but she was friends with the mayor, uh, Gleason, uh, at the time, and so was able to move back into the same cottage, even though it was now in a white section of O'Galley. And we have uh, an exhibit here, uh, Zora Neale Hurston in Brevard County, that talks all, all about uh, that period as well. Uh, I uh, mentioned Mrs. Nathiri's uh, uh, forming the association to preserve the Edenville community and stopping that road from destroying the town, but I, I did really mention the Zora Neale Hurston Festival of the Arts and Humanities, which is entering its 24th year uh, this uh, January, uh, and of course we in February this year, uh, and uh, you have done so much to help raise awareness about Hurston over the past couple of decades. Can you speak to uh, the, the festival and its impact uh, uh, on getting the word out of so. I would, um, I sometimes uh, actually wonder about the weight that Zora Neale Hurston has in terms of, let's say, um, world culture. I'm not, I don't, I don't want me to overstate, but what I'm making reference to is the, the kind of um, engagement that people 
from different parts of the world have in terms of the subject material. Case in point, uh, this year we will have two Russian students um, who are upper, upper undergraduate, uh, juniors and seniors. They will be coming with their professor who has been attending a uh, festival for the last several years uh, as a part of a relationship with the University of Central Florida. Now, we have had uh, scholars from the Indian subcontinent, from West Africa, uh, from Australia, from different parts of the world. Uh, but I have to say that it really is quite something to meet students from Japan or from Russia who actually know Eatonville, the geography, uh, you know, the relationship between Maitland, uh, Church Street, and the, the literary references. I mean, they have studied, and they know them, and they know them in the same way that I might remember Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, or Dickens' to, uh, uh, Table Two Cities. In other words, the, the way that they grapple with the content uh, is really, uh, is, is really uh, quite something. Uh, I remember, and I will, I will come to a festival, uh, but Eatonville, what Zorn University has done in terms of place is make Eatonville a literary destination. And so yes, uh, the last week in January for the last 23 years, we will see literally tens of thousands of people. Uh, this past year, we actually hired the UCF Rosen College of Hospitality Management to document the number of people who come because you don't believe it. If you come to Eatonville now, um, you know, you just don't believe it. You think that, you know, these people are just, you know, they're blowing smoke. So we had, um, had a group to actually click. And on a Saturday, um, 60,000 people walked. I mean, you know, we know that some people are duplicate, but the point is, you know, tens of thousands of people come to Eatonville. And uh, so why is that? It is um, because festival actually has done three things consistently. It's, you know, in a way it's very, uh, it's very boring if you say it's, the goals are always the same, to celebrate the life and work of Zora Neale Hurston, to celebrate the historic significance of Eatonville as the oldest incorporated African American municipality in the country, and celebrate the cultural contributions which people of African ancestry have made to the United States and the world culture. And so what we look at is a very, and I should say to you that we're all really just middle-aged um, educators. And so, you know, all we're doing is always trying to insinuate as much, you know, really information, knowledge um, as possible. So you have the end, the in, what we call the inside programs that happen the first five days of festival. And then you have the outside program, which is the outdoor festival of the arts. And even there, where we are trying to always, you know, bring to the to the public information. Now people call it education, edutainment, you know, it's it's based on that. So you have, for example, then uh, really the creme de la creme of, of the cultural class. You have Alice Walker, you have the late John Hope Franklin, or you have um, uh, Betty Saw, or you have Marcus Roberts, um, you, you have the people who are uh, Dr. Maya Angelou or Ruby Dee or the late Oxy Davis. You have all of these people who are really distinguished who come, and they come as a part of a five-year cycle. In other words, we organize what we're doing in five years. We look at a, an, an overall theme, and then each festival explores that theme. And so the staying power the staying power is such that whether you are in secondary school, or whether you are functionally illiterate, or whether you are a postdoctoral uh, doctoral, um, person, you are able to find something that truly does engage your work. For example, for our festival this year, we have particularly strong offerings in the secondary school system. Uh, offerings. Florida Historical Society will be uh, bringing work that is, that is tailored to meet the Sunshine Standards or what is now the standards. The Orlando Science Center will be doing 
uh, chicken heart dissection. The College of Medicine is going to be uh, bringing material. Again, as these students come, they're going to actually have information that is going to be presented in an outdoor classroom kind of setting. Um, at, we will have the Russian students who are coming to participate in international scholarly forums at their level. Um, we will have Question Bridge, which is an installation um, at the Zoya Personal Museum looking at intergenerational discussion between African-American men, the backdrop being particularly of interest because of the Trayvon Martin. Uh, this was not done because of it, but you know, you just have that kind of that kind of interplay. So festival has really uh, simply leveraged Edenville as a literary destination. And because so much of it is based within the intellectual sphere and so much of it in the aesthetic sphere, then people know that they can count on very, very high quality work in that setting. And I would uh, close this by just giving this kind of anecdote. Um, oh, in the early 2000s, our theme was dance. And we um, were presenting um, an interview with uh, Dr. Catherine Dunham. We had brought the Ohio Contemporary Dance Company uh, there. And uh, Diane Hubbard Bur Burns, I believe, who was then uh, a journalist at the, uh, a reporter at the Orlando Sentinel, uh, wrote, wrote me a note. And I, I sort of refused that Perhaps her editor wouldn't have been so pleased for her to be so effusive because you know a reporter is supposed to be, um, how do you say, just uh, objective, you know. But she she said, I can't thank you enough because you have brought to Central Florida some people that I have always wanted to be able to hear and listen to and. We don't get a chance in Central Florida <coughs> to experience this kind of programming, except, she said, at the Zoya Workers and Festival time. And uh, it was just really quite something to get that kind of letter from a student of dance who was a reporter, because it just it let us know that what we're doing is truly a cultural event, not something that is in a box that you can say is ethnic, but that is something that, you know, the, the spirit, the intellect, um, and the mind. And that, that is what we are very, um, what we're very pleased at. Now from the commercial aspect of it, um, the Orange County government has, over the last number of years, uh, made an investment in what is called tourist development tax money. And the big thing about that is ROI, rate of return on investment. And so, you know, that's, I mean, that's the, that, that is the real deal. And so for us, um, from third party research, we know that for every dollar that the county has invested in Zora Festival, for example, we return six or seven dollars because people are coming from outside the tri-county area, which means they stay overnight, they are spending <coughs> money that they wouldn't spend normally. And uh, one, last, uh, one last piece, uh, in 2001, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, I did a study on what they call cultural tourism success stories, because if you do cultural tourism, you're supposed to, there are best practices, you know, that you're authentic, that you're not subverting your place by commercialization, that kind of thing. Uh, there were 23 such stories uh, that they identified in the United States. Only one in Florida is on the first festival. Mm -hmm. So if you know that kind of accolade, it, it, it keeps you moving um, to have that kind of acknowledgement. As an neighbor of Eatonville, I wanted to add, it is very impressive in the intellectual and aesthetic sphere, but there's also the fun sphere. <laughs> that to some of us is equally important. I'm sorry, everyone. Well, that's because you um, were all in the <laughs> there, There's some wonderful food. Um, the music, I love the jazz I've heard there. My students tell me there's wonderful rap. I have trouble understanding what wonderful rap is, but <laughs> my students assure me it is wonderful rap for there. And there's a street market.
gets encountered in Key West, as Sandra was talking about when he went down there. Remember that Ernest Hemingway said to have and have not in Key West, mid 1930s, published it in 1937. And it is also the only novel that he said in the United States, if you want to consider Key West part of the United States. <laughs>
think, uh, pro prosperity. Yeah. It really, yes. To me, I mean, it, it was a, uh, a public humiliation mm -hmm. for no reason.
uh, published by black nonfiction writers.
but who she was and that she had been a writer and her, her employer was so embarrassed she, she, she fired her. Six months, May. Oh, we got a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> and she was there a grand six months and hit on the trial. <laughs> this goes back to the, to the Federal Writers Project and what, what was the purpose of writing these state books. And surely it was really uh, envisioned by FDR as promotional literature. And I suspect that a lot of those writers, and some of them were quite skilled as, as Stetson was and as Zora was, their idea was promotion of the arts and not necessarily the states. And I, I, I do think that now we see these uh, Zora and Stetson who were not uh, uh, considered promoters of Florida in any way during their lifetimes. Now Florida is promoting Stetson and Zora as as part of our wonderful heritage, and they would, I think both of them would be uh, somewhat astonished that this would be turn out to be the case. Yeah. And maybe pleased, maybe yeah. both of them would be very pleased that we grew up. They're writers, they have egos. <laughs>